So on behalf of uh, the Baha'i Chair for Studies in Development uh, at Devi Ahilya uh, Vishwa Vidyale in Indore, I would like to uh, first of all welcome our distinguished speaker for today, uh, Mr. KJ Joy, and also all our participants uh, who are joining this lecture both on uh, Zoom, which is the platform on which we are, as well as through our live uh, Facebook uh, feed, where we also have participants uh, signing in from there. This lecture is part of the series that has been organized by the Baha'i Chair, uh, titled Dialogues on Development. And the theme of today's lecture, an extremely important one for the uh, vision of uh, India's development. Um, as, as we know, um, um, India lives in its villages, at least to a, to a good extent. If, even if one doesn't uh, consider villages as the locus, one still would think of communities. And so the question uh, that today's uh, uh, lecture is going to address, which is vital for uh, the sustainability of uh, you know, development in the Indian context is community management of the commons in the context of water governance. Uh, uh, Mr. KJ Joy is uh, the founding member and senior fellow of Society for Promoting Participative Ecosystem Management in Pune. And he is also the convener of the Forum for Policy Dialogue on Water Conflicts in India. Mr. Joy has been an activist researcher for nearly 40 years, and his areas of interest include drought, participatory irrigation ma management, river basin management, uh, multi-stakeholder processes, water conflicts, dams and hydropower, renewable energy, water ethics and people's movements. He was a Fulbright Fellow with the University of California at Berkeley and was the recipient of the TN Koshu Memorial Award in 2016. He has published extensively on water environment and development issues. His most recent uh, edited book being Split Waters, the idea of water conflicts. Without taking too much of time, uh, uh, I would like to uh, hand over the, the floor to uh, Mr. Joy, uh, so for him to share his comments. Uh, just before we start, I, I wanted to add that uh, participants can post their questions and their comments in the Q&A box. Um, and we will have time after Mr. Joy has made his remarks, we will have time to discuss your questions and comments. So please make sure you post your questions and comments e even even during the presentation. Uh, so, um, thanks, uh, Professor Arish, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And first of all, I'm thankful to Professor Arish for giving me a chance to be part of this uh, uh, series on dialogues and development. I think it's an important thing. Uh, I think I attended one or two earlier, so I know uh, you know the level of discussions and other type of things. So I'm really happy to be uh, part of this series. Um, I should also uh, right at the outset say that um, you know water, uh, and as uh, Professor Arish said, it's a very important uh, thing in, in all of our lives. Uh, but I should also say that it's a pretty vast. Uh, area. Uh, so within uh, 40, 45 minutes of uh, dealing with it, I think probably two things will happen. One, I'm going to pick and choose what I think is important, uh, you know, around this theme of uh, community management of the commons in the context of water governance. So uh, some of the few issues which I think is important 
uh, you know, uh, in the context of this thing, one. Second, probably uh, I may not have the time to get into too much nuances uh, in the presentation itself, but I think we can pick it up, uh, you know, since there's some time for discussions and things, then maybe we can de download some of them in a little more detailed time. Um, uh, I should also acknowledge that what I'm going to present is nothing very you know, original uh, in the sense of that, you know, is uh, what I have developed or anything, but uh, it has been a journey for me in the water sector last 30, 40 years. So probably as an activist, as a researcher, uh, working with a lot of organizations and colleagues, uh, you know, so it's more of a, a collaborative development of some of these approaches and ideas which I would present. So, uh, so there is nothing which is of mine much. I my only thing is that okay, probably there's a problem in what I'm saying. I take the ownership of that, and I can also see among the participants some of my own colleagues and uh, with whom I worked over the last so many years. So uh, nice to you know see uh, some of them in this uh, discussion. So what I would do is that right in the beginning, when we say about uh, community management uh, of uh, you know, water as commons, uh, probably, probably we need to spend a couple of minutes to see the context in which uh, today we are talking about this particular issue. I'm sure if you had talked about the same topic, maybe 30 years back, maybe pre-1990, uh, it has a very different context to offer. Uh, but today, I think when we talk about this particular issue about uh, uh, community management of the commons in the context of, you know, uh, you know, seeing water as commons and the whole involvement of the community in its management and governance, then probably today it has a very different context. And I think so. I just have about three or four bullets and I'm not going to go into the deep. One is I think we need to take note of uh, climate change and its relationship with water. And all of us know, I'm not going to get into the details of climate change and or climate crisis, um, uh, you know, what is there, but we all know and we're all experiencing. Um, uh, you know what is happening and one of the important sectors where climate change is playing out uh, whether in terms of um, you know droughts floods uneven rains uh, very intense spells sometimes uh, all that i think we are all experiencing even in this year uh, thing i mean sikkim is we can see it clearly but i would not say that the entire thing is about climate change because there's a tendency to naturalize climate change. Today, whatever is happening in the water sector, whether it is flood, drought, everything is today, you know, tagged on to uh, climate change. But I think along with the changing climate, a whole lot of other things are changing. For example, land use is changing, which also has an important uh, relationship with uh, climate factors and, um, you know, water uh, per se. So we need to problematize the type of political economy, ecology uh, around which is playing out. And I think that has been done uh, seriously. Uh, it is also true that probably to say to produce the same amount of food, we may need more water because you know the higher evaporation or evapotranspiration rates because of the temperature rise. And I think today the assessment clearly showed that we are already touching maybe 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, compared to the pre-industrial area, and maybe by 2040-50, we are talking looking at a scenario of um, uh, you know, two, uh, two degree or even more. So it can be pretty disastrous. And I think when you talk about uh, water as a common resource, maybe this uh, context we need to keep in mind. The second context, I think that when we talk about water, um, you know, uh, commons, I think very important things, especially when you look at um, rural areas and agriculture per se, we find that um, maybe from the 90s or I would say from the 2000s, there is a large reallocation of water taking place. Now, the whole issue is that when you talk about water commons, where is we located? What type of water are we talking about? Today, uh, there are assessments which is done. I think our own friends in Prayas has done some study over the last 10, 12 years, how much is the amount of water which is reallocated from the rural landscape to the urban, uh, especially to meet the urban um, um, uh, domestic requirements or industrial requirements and things. And today we are talking about a developmental scenario or a pathway. We're saying that by another 10 years or something, you're going to have a 5 trillion economy. So we need to critically look at, uh, you know, when we talk about water is commons, whose commons it is going to be, where the water is going to be used, et cetera, et cetera. And this is also giving rise to a whole lot of contestations and conflicts uh, in the water sector. And this is also related to uh, what I call um, um, uh, the whole, sorry, uh, uh, the whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, increasing tendency towards privatization and commodification. Uh, this is a topic which I'll like to come back a little later because we can see different types of privatization taking place. 
water becoming a commodity in terms of buying and selling, etc. Whether you sell water rights today or whether you uh, privatize certain water sources itself, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, which some of the Western countries are trying to do uh, in terms of tradable water rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think this is taking place uh, very increasingly, and this has an immediate relevance to the topic of our discussion today. I also like to just uh, the last uh, in terms of setting the context uh, in terms of access to water and what is happening to this. I am uh, very consciously showing this report of composite water management index, which came out in 2018 by the Niti Aayog. Uh, the numbers are very staggering. For example, it says that uh, we are facing the one of the worst water crises in its history. Millions of lives and lives are under threat. About 600 million Indian. Uh, Indians face high to extreme water stress. When we talk about 600 million, it's about what 50% of our population is in that bracket. Nearly 2 lakh people die every year due to inadequate access to safe water. And also, it says that by 2030, um, our demand is going to be much more uh, than what is the water available and things, which has got tremendous impact on uh, you know uh, uh, people, their lives and livelihoods and things. Now, it is not that none of us knew these numbers. And I think today numbers and data has become a very political thing. But this has come from Niti Aayog itself. So probably I'm sure nobody will contest these numbers and things. So it is this broadly this context. I think there are other elements we can bring into setting the context. But when we talk about the community participation, when we talk about uh, water as commons, I think uh, probably we need to pitch our discussions uh, in the broader contours of what is happening to uh, water and things. Um, what I'm proposed to do is that uh, in the remaining part of it, I'm going to broadly divide into three uh, parts um, where uh, I'll be taking about one. I would like to problematize uh, what we call, what is this community and community management in the context of water commons? I think this is something which we need some discussions and probably if possible that we all come to the same page of or same understanding. It's an important type of thing. In the second part, then uh, I will develop de on some what I broadly call, and there are other people also have called it, uh, the, the biophysical and the sociocultural peculiarities or special characteristics of water that set us apart from uh, you know other resources, whether it is forests, whether it is land, etc. And I do believe that this has a bearing on when we say uh, water is commons and community management. What are its nuances? What does it imply, etc., uh, etc. Et and in the third part. When we talk about water governance, I would like to dwell upon what we mean by water governance and also uh, if when we say participatory um, or community management of water commons has to lead to certain desirable outcomes, then probably it has to be within the contours of certain normative concerns we have. So that is how where I would like to end the uh, today's uh, presentation. I know it doesn't cover all the parts and things so because the time constraint and things. Uh, let me start the discussion by saying that when we talk about, um, you know, um, community management, the first image which comes to our mind is about traditional water systems. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it has be become part of the social consciousness today uh, in the country that um, before the colonizers came or British, the advent of uh, colonialism in the country, uh, probably uh, we had, you know, community managed uh, water commons, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are exam examples. And they're all well-studied examples. Now, tanks in, uh, tanks in South India, uh, for example, uh, tanks in Tamil Nadu. There is also recent discovery or recent studies, critical engagement with the uh, tanks in Eastern India, for example. Uh, there is an interesting system in Maharashtra called FUD system, which is in the northeastern part of uh, Maharashtra, the Dhule and the Nashik district, where uh, the uh, the streams or the rivers are not permanently dammed, they, they are diverted to take to your uh, service area or the agriculture crop area. And the agriculture crops area is divided into different FUDs or different cluster of uh, lands and where there's a commonly agreed upon cropping pattern and also certain rules and regulations about, um, you know, uh, uh, how people get access to water, what's the rules, you know, the uh, functions, uh, duties, et cetera, et cetera, of this. 
Also in the Himal uh, Himachal Pradesh, we see systems like pools, where also it has been traditional system is managed by the uh, communities and things. So there are many such examples, or even Rajasthan, we get such examples where community managed um, uh, this. I think Anubha Misraji has documented some of these, uh, you know, uh, cases from um, uh, uh, Rajasthan. Now, uh, the issue is that the mainstream narrative today tell us that prior to the arrival of colonizers, the water systems in India were managed by communities as commons. And the underlying things that the British has destroyed these systems either to, you know, in through two ways. One is that there is a change in cropping pattern uh, because uh, crops which are not earlier grown in India to that extent probably been promoted, incentivized, and for that irrigation systems were specially designed. Uh, maybe cotton, indigo, other type of crops, because they had a value addition potential in the in Britain, so that the raw material used to be sent there and type of thing. So that is one of the reasons which is often said uh, why the traditional irrigation systems or traditional water systems collapsed in India during the British time. The second um, uh, um, fact uh, aspect of that is that there was a change in terms of water tariff collection system or the revenue system, which I think they which has changed. So there could be other reasons too, but these are the two main reasons which are generally given uh, why uh, during the colonial time, mainly the British time, uh, the traditional water systems collapsed in the country. And you can see evidences. Now, for example, Nirmal Sangupta has done very interesting work in the 80s, for example, uh, looking at the South Bihar system of uh, Ahar and the Pine, that is the Tang and the Channel network. And where he has said that they started breaking down following the introduction of a new revenue system, shift from the produce. You know, part of the produce used to be given as the water tariff for the revenue type of thing to fixed and then to cash rents. That impacted the maintenance of the Ahar Pine system. So this is one of the reasons which a very interesting study Nirmal uh, Sengupta has done. Or even uh, we have seen the uh, you know Center for Science and Environment has done a fantastic documentation of the uh, traditional systems. The book is called The Dying Wisdom in which um, it also says that the traditional water systems declined uh, by and large uh, uh, because of the colonial actions, which is basically for profit and rule. So you find this type of narrative saying that, uh, 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 you know, it is the actions of the uh, Britishers which has actually uh, destroyed uh, our traditional system, which are primarily seen as, uh, you know, uh, community management and things that I think is important to uh, problematize community here to some extent, which we'll come to a little later. Now, there is also counter narrative to this. So, uh, though mainstream narrative is what I said, there are also people saying that, uh, you know, who have questioned this. There are scholars who have questioned this narrative that British colonialism is the only reason for the decay of the traditional water systems. And these scholars have been asking us to look at um, internally uh, what is the type of contradictions these societies carried and things, and uh, probably they also contributory factors uh, why some of these systems collapse. Now, for example, uh, we have David Hardiman's work in Gujarat itself, where he has looked at um, uh, predominantly uh, well irrigation. So where he says commercialization, peasant indebtedness were processes that not only predated uh, colonial rule, but were more to do with expanding well irrigation Gujarat. Uh, in fact, David Moss, who has done extensive work in Tamil Nadu and especially among, uh, uh, around the tank system, uh, it says that um, claims of organic and autonomous villages sustaining stable water management practices prior to the British rule cannot be empirically validated. In fact, uh, David Moss is one person who has brought in, uh, for example, things like caste and other type of things when you talk about um, you know, tank systems and things. And uh, our own study shows that, especially in uh, this, it is basically uh, the upper caste who were the landholders uh, who were supposed to be the community and things, and people um, who were the lower caste or the Dalits today, what we call, um, uh, they were not part of this whole community managed systems and things. They did not have any water rights, they were not part of the decision making. At the most, what you've seen that, uh, what you call the watermen or uh, those who you know distribute the water uh, in Marathi, we call the patkaris, uh, or such type of uh, manual work has been given to the landless and the Dalits and things. But in terms of managing, governing these systems, probably most of these people have been outside uh, what we define uh, community. Um, 
Uh, I would say that it is true that some of the traditional water systems did decline during the uh, British time. Now, uh, if you read Rohan D'Souza's work, it's an interesting analysis is done about that and where he talks about colonial hydrology. His claim is that, in fact, one of the important contributing factor, one of the uh, uh, what you call departure points out of the colonial scheme, the entire irrigation system changed. So the conceptual notion of colonial hydrology characterizes the colonial interventions in water, uh, based in the form of diversion structures, large uh, systems, uh, irrigation or canals, and other type of things, comprised of a cogent and distinct hydraulic paradigm which actually different, uh, you know, fundamentally uh, different from the what you call uh, the traditional systems and which help to realign land and water in new set of social, political, and ecological relationships. So one of the important things which happened was that, for example, systems or areas where they had much more subsistence cropping, subsistence agriculture, uh, water is being used as more of a protective irrigation today being brought into 12 monthly irrigation systems and things. So you find a very different relationship between water and land and crops, et cetera, et cetera, coming up and things. In fact, this is that uh, thing also, which otherwise called a hydraulic mission mode. In fact, um, hydraulic mission is something which started um, uh, towards the end of uh, 19th century in Europe, and it got fully expanded and fully uh, brought into a system in the 20th century. In fact, this uh, uh, actually uh, um, is a complete departure in terms of an approach and worldview from the traditional systems which we talked about, whether it is tanks, whether it is the other type of systems, uh, which was this. So what was the main characters of that? It tried to combine three things. One, scientism, that science can solve any problem. Science is the ultimate God, which we have, and that and also an ideology of the domination of nature. Uh, nature can be dominated by humans, a very anthropocentric viewpoint about uh, looking at uh, you know, uh, nature and also technology to do it. So we find that a full flowering of this taking place uh, in the 20th century and people like Mole uh, has called this a defining feature of the 20th century. Now, interestingly, where the hydraulic mission actually started and flowered and things. Uh, they have now, you know, left this. Now, if you find there, the whole water, uh, water sector today and the type of interventions they make, they seem to be much more aligned with uh, the contours of nature and they don't make such hard interventions and things. But India still seems to be preoccupied uh, with this paradigm of um, water. Um, you know, for example, interlinking of rivers or other type of huge infrastructure projects we are making, hydro projects in the uh, northeast uh, part of India, especially Sikkim, where we are facing this whole problem today. Uh, we are all reading about, uh, you know, Tista 3 uh, and things and other type of things. So this type of paradigm still is the most dominant paradigm uh, in the country. Um, I also like to draw your attention and uh, try to um, finish this first part of my presentation when we problematize community and community management, this whole relationship between caste and waters. I think we need to squarely ask this question, ki what caste is water? Uh, so it is no wonder, it's not a surprise that uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar's first political action was about the, was the Mahad Satyagraha in 1927, where you can see this picture there, that is the uh, Chaudar Tala. Uh, where he mobilized uh, people and had a satyagraha in 1927 to say that this talab should be open to the Dalits as well. So in fact, um, uh, in the second picture, which where my the cursor is, there is a Marathi saying, which is translated into this, just below his statue uh, on this. This struggle is not for water alone, but to establish fundamental human rights. So, and also in his speech that day, he also said that, <clears throat> Um, it is not as if drinking the water of the Chavdar Lake will make us immortal. We have survived well enough all these days without drinking it. We are not going to the Chavdar Lake merely to drink its water. We are going to the lake to assert that we too are human beings like others. It must be clear that this meeting has been called to test up, uh, to set up the norm of equality. So my question is that, why is that? In none of the traditional narratives about the traditional systems of these issues of this type never come up. Does not caste matter? 
when you talk about community management, the Dalis, the SOL untouchables, are they not part of the community? Why is that in none of the environmental narratives? Uh, issues of this thing don't come up. And I think this is very uh, thing. And there are now interesting um, uh, studies of the young Ambedkarite scholars who are looking at Ambedkar from an uh, environmental lens and which they call uh, the environmental egalitarian or uh, 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 things, much from an equity and fairness perspective. There's an effort to rediscover some of these uh, things. And I think uh, probably we, unless we bring these narratives also into our um, uh, discourse or discussion about community, community managed irrigation systems or water systems, uh, probably we are also leaving behind uh, uh, the whole deprived, you know, for thousands of years, they have borne the brunt of caste and, you know, I mean, the whole question of purity, uh, you know, touch, untouchability, I know, whole touching the water itself can pollute uh, uh, the whole thing. I think these all things go, and this is also today being played around. I mean, some of the occupations are being treated as polluting, so they are banned, and some are not. So I think these are also follow the whole conduits of caste uh, to a great extent. In fact, there's an interesting poem by Namdev Dasal. Namdev Dasal was the one of the main faces of the uh, Dalit Panther movement in the 70s and 80s uh, in Mumbai and Maharashtra. So he has this book called Gold Pita, which has been translated by Dilip Chitra, who is a very famous literary person uh, in this. I'm just giving only two lines. It's very interesting to read the full poem. Somebody is interested, I can you know, share it, this poem. You will draw water upstream and we downstream. We means the earth well untouchables. Bravo, bravo, how you teach Chadur Varnya even to the water in your sanctified style. So I think these are hard realities which we in the water sector need to engage with, which we are not been able to do. Even in Maharashtra, I think in the 70s and 80s, there was a very important social movement called Ek Gao Ek Panota, which broadly translated as called One Village, One Water Source or Water Well. Uh, it was in the 70s and 80s and led by people like Baba Adav and other socialist leaders in this country. Um, uh, one of my young researchers also uh, uh, friends uh, actually is also looking at this water and caste. So that's, that's what I'm saying. There's a re-engagement with this question uh, in a new uh, way. Now, coming to another set of issues, I think when we talk about um, water's comments and community participation, community management and things that uh, probably uh, what is happening today in the modern uh, period, I would say probably what I mean, the very later period, like maybe late 80s and uh, early 90s, where we went for uh, in this whole question of economic reforms and what is impact on water. Again, it is going to be very cursory touching upon, we call it as the LPG regime, liberalization, privatization, globalization. And it has how to, like any other uh, social sectors or resource sectors, water also had a tremendous impact on that. If you look at any of the policy documents or legal instruments, which happened after that, we find all these uh, things. This So there's an increase in tendency towards to uh, privatize, uh, privatization uh, and uh, making water as more of a, a commodity, which can be bought and sold for profit, et cetera, et cetera. And this whole global discourse, which is taking place, like water is more now seen as an economic good, which means that water will be allo uh, allocated to users or sectors which will produce which will bring in more revenue or more economic returns as the this not the state as a distributor allocator of water but it will be done on more on economic principles that is one second when you talk about water pricing and water tariff then there is a high chance that the uh, economically weaker the underprivileged will be priced out of water because the whole emphasis to bring the entire uh, you know, cost which has been sunk uh, in making the water available, including the capital cost, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something which is happening, which has a tremendous bearing when we talk about communities and uh, community management and water's comments and things. Um, here also, I would say, I'm sorry, yeah, say that, um, you know, there are two types of uh, water privatization which is taking place. One is what uh, broadly I call um, um, the source privatization, the, what, the source of water itself gets privatized. Uh, it can be in the form of groundwater, it can be in the form of uh, surface water, it can be in the form of uh, streams, rivers, whatever it is, or dams getting privatized uh, things. Or there are also water rights being traded. In fact, Maharashtra is one of the states which is trying to do this in India through the Maharashtra Water Regulatory Authority, which has been set up. And one of the functions is to set the rules for these such tradings and things. This has been happening globally across, like, um, uh, for example, in Australia, 
and uh, anybody officials in the water sector in India, they hold Mare Darling as the darling of the water sector today. And that is, I think, being played out there as well. So what they want to bring in into India is also this whole question of making water as a tradable commodity and things. And the second aspect of what I am saying is the whole question of service delivery, getting privatized you know, through uh, public private partnerships or uh, whatever names you give, giving to private agencies coming into uh, water delivery, especially municipal water supplies and things. I'm sure some of you might have seen this picture. This is the Shivna River, which has been the first case in India where a stretch of, I'm sure Arash would be familiar with this because this is in his territory. Uh, of, um, you know, earlier with uh, Madhya Pradesh, now it's part of Chhattisgarh, uh, which is a tributary of the Mahanadi Basin, where a stretch of uh, river, I think about 15 kilometers, has been given to a particular company on a, well, I think, build, operate, transfer type of a principle, uh, in which local people, we are not even allowed to access water because uh, this was been uh, given to them. And there was a massive struggle against that. So this is one example of what I call um, water source privatization. Um, the second is the very famous case is the Plachimata case in Kerala in Palakkad district where the whole conflict was around, uh, you know, what was given to a bottling plant, Coca-Cola, and there was a massive struggle against it and things. And today, the uh, the whole uh, plant has been locked down and locked out and things. There are a lot of literature about this. In terms of um, um, uh, in terms of uh, service delivery, this is a, I mean, this happening not only in Kandwa. Uh, in fact, this is an interesting study by Mandhan, which has been done on this whole PPP model there. And I've learned a lot from that uh, particular article they have written for a uh, publication. So this even picture is from that, where also uh, in uh, what a uh, you know, service delivery is being privatized, either through whatever these call this public-private partnerships or even outright uh, privatization giving you know to uh, private agents. So this is also coming up in this. So when we talk about... Um, uh, you know, commoning water, recommoning water, uh, or community management, etc., etc. These are the things what's happening today, and uh, we need to engage with uh, such issues and things. And also, uh, uh, I would say that um, we also need to talk about, you know, when we say about community, community management, water commons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we also need to say that we are also talking in a, a system which is capitalist system and things where anything and everything they will do to make profits and things. Basically, the commodification comes from this. So there are new frontiers of capitalism uh, in the country, basically trying to capitalize uh, nature or its elements, whether it is water, air, wind, sun, what you say, what you are, this all been brought into market today and you being used for profit. So that's why people like David Harvey, I mean, this is also a point which has been often discussion today, the whole or exploitation today. Exploitation and appropriation of uh, surpluses is not only taking place by surplus you generate through uh, labor, but also by bringing in new frontiers into capitalized uh, production and things. So accumulation by disposition has been expression to capture the second part of the uh, you know, uh, accumulation process which is taking place. And in fact, we can see this in the water sector as well in many ways. So this is the first part which I've learned to set up saying that when we talk about a community and community participation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we need to actually uh, interrogate this and see, and especially in the context of the traditional systems one, and also the type of onslaught today uh, uh, because of the economic reforms and other type of, which is also in a way, uh, capitalism try to restructure itself to some extent. So we need to bring these discussions uh, into our uh, purview uh, when we talk about uh, waters commons and community management, etc. So in the second part, um, um, I would like to bring up a few issues related to uh, the biophysical and sociocultural uh, aspects or characteristics of water. Um, and I feel that they have a very direct bearing and in fact actually strengthens our argument to say that water should be treated as a commons and things. So precisely that's why I'm going to bring in some of these discussions. Um, this is a, I mean, uh, say, we say that water is an ecosystem resource. Now we say that what is an embedded resource is not a standalone uh, type uh, thing. So it is embedded within the ecosystems or different uh, uh, elements of that. And it's not a resource which you can freely manipulate or indiscriminately mined. Like for example, corn probably 
or iron ore, you can maybe be able to mine it, but water is not that because it's through whatever water you get today at the end, it goes through right from the precipitation to ultimately what you see as surface water or in your groundwater goes through a whole lot of processes and interconnected nature and things. It gets partitioned to different things. In fact, these two diagrams I've taken from uh, my friends, um, uh, uh, Srinivasan and Lele, uh, from a chapter of their contributory book uh, in 2019, in which they, in fact, very nicely explained the first uh, graph, so okay, where human intervention is not there, what happens to water and rainfall? How does it get partitioned, the different elements? How are they interconnected? And the second picture actually shows the B uh, with intervention, either in the forms of surface storages, dams, or pumping or bore wells or other wells, what happens, uh, the different type of uses and how it also generates return flows or wastewater, what you call very often and things and this relationship. So when we say about water and water commons, we need to see also water as an ecosystem resource. And you cannot see water in its abstracted form without all this interconnectedness and the impact uh, each other and things. So one of the direct implication of this, that is this whole discussion about environmental flows. Uh, basically flow required for the preservation of ecosystem services and things. Uh, water is, uh, I mean, rivers are just not uh, only water. It also carries sediments. It carries biota, energy, et cetera, et cetera. And things. there are riparian systems which are dependent on that. And even for the down, the water needs of the downstream people, we need to keep certain amount or certain proportion of water unbound. And today we are talking about systems, especially in the peninsular India, most of real systems don't even meet the sea. It is, the expression is called a closed basin or a closing basins. So we are looking at that uh, today. So then probably uh, we need to uh, reassess the type of interventions we make in our river systems or water systems uh, to see what is this long-term impacts and things. The second important thing when you talk about the ecosystem uh, uh, is that uh, the whole question of pollution. Uh, the water quality issue is very critical. The issue is that who is returning, how much and in what form and in what condition. Very often industries say that we use only maybe 2% or 3% of the water, but the issue is that what is the impact that uh, the return flow the industrial use creates as wastewater or what coming out of the system and what is the type of pollution load and how much more it can pollute is also an important question. So this is one thing which we talk about what is common is that these elements like water to be seen as an ecosystem resource and second a certain amount of water to be kept flowing and is also part of the you know you know we nowadays say that uh, the right of the river to flow to some extent and also the pollution issue the second element which is very much connected when you talk about water as common is the water is to be seen as a common pool resource so uh, many of us in the water sector know that, um, uh, uh, you know, surface water by and large is treated as a uh, public, uh, what you call a common property is owned by the community or if it has smaller systems or uh, by the state, that is the understanding. But when it comes to groundwater, then it is more like a, uh, what you call a private property regime and things. So the argument here is that when we say common pool character water, irrespective of the property right, if you are to really manage uh, water uh, in an equitable, sustainable manner, then we need to treat water as a common pool resources and things. And we also say that there's an issue of, you know, one of the important characters of common pool resource is that there's an issue of subtractability. Like it's not a public good. And the example very often given in the literature is that if either one person or a hundred percent sit under a public, uh, what you call a street light, generally everybody gets the same amount of water, uh, same amount of light. The number of people sharing that light does not actually subtract or diminish the light, which is this. But in the case of water, uh, for example, one in unit of water which is given to somebody becomes unavailable to another person or another user and things. So there's a whole issue of, uh, you know, uh, that, um, so that is one important characteristics of uh, 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 water as a common resource that once a particular unit of water is allocated and used, then that becomes unavailable for something else, unlike, you know, other public good, uh, goods and things. Third important thing is that water is also, it can be divided, it can be shared. Uh, if you have, let's say, 10 liters of water, that 10 liters of water can be equally divided as one liter each and given to 10 people or 10 uses, but that still remains as water. So these are important characteristics of water because uh, 
this is also um, creates a lot of trade-offs. How this, what is divided, how it is shared, how it is allocated, it can give you know conflicts and contestations and things. And many of these conflicts today, what related conflicts we talk about is related to that. Um, then um, the other important thing which you talk about water is a common food resource that it has a unique directionality. In, we all know that it flows in a particular direction. It according to a gradient from upper to the lower reaches and things. But the relationship between the upstream and the downstream is, is not equal, is, is asymmetric because the actions of the upstream people can impact the downstream people because the flow of the water is from upstream to downstream, but not the other way around. The downstream people's water, uh, downstream people's action cannot impact on the uh, upstream people. Probably when Namdev Dazal says, that you know, we draw water from downstream, it also implies uh, some of these issues and things. Uh, another important thing, probably I need to little rush up, I'm seeing 340 already. Yeah, so, um, uh, so we also need to see that water is both a local and a non recurrent resource. It has got scales, like it can, water can be seen at a particular basin level. This is the basin of I mean, the Krishna Basin. And water can be also at a micro watershed scale and type of thing, the quantities and other type of uh, character we talk about differ. But very often in our own uh, civil society discussions, we primarily see uh, water only as a local resource. And when we talk about community management, very often it's implied that water is a local resource and things. But I think probably wa uh, water is both a local and a non-local resource. And we need to take this difference seriously when we talk about community participation. Then if you also say that water is also a non-local, then our definition of a community also would change to some extent. So, um, so the way we plan water can cause externalities then, you know, that type of intervention to make. We have these slogans like Gao Ka Pani Gao Mem, which is very important slogan in terms of water conservation. But my claim or my argument is that it doesn't actually capture the entire complexity of interconnectedness at a basin scale, uh, water and things. So it also needs an approach which, you know, at different scales, right from micro watershed to sub basin basins and that also cuts across state boundaries national boundaries because many of our river systems are uh, transboundary in nature and things now the important point which i want to make here is that when you come to rights and especially when you go to community management water commons so our own viewpoint about rights can we say that local communities should have full right over water that flows through them or and also, if that's so, then what we talk about, you know, inter-basin equity, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is an issue which we need discussions and things. Otherwise, our commonsensical understanding is that the community, the local community should have full 100% right over the water which flows through their doorstep and things. So a pro one another way of looking at it is that every community has a proportional right to water as part of a collective right to assured livelihood. So this is where we need to bring in, we need about community management, water is common saying that, What's the type of entitlement and water rights or right to what we're talking about is that it is actually a proportionate share, uh, which is a collective right and things, not that, you know, a particular community has an absolute right over uh, the water that flows through and things. Um, it has also some social cultural dimensions of water and things. And very here, I think I would say key, almost all our water needs, especially when you come to uh, domestic drinking water and water for productive uses like agriculture or artisanal work and things is very often mediated through your uh, cultural, social, cultural practices, value systems and things. And very often, and that is where I want to bring caste again into the discussion is that very often this is a missing link in our uh, thing when we talk about social cultural trends and some of these things need not be very egalitarian, need not be uh, very equitable and often exploitative. Um, um, and also we need to question whether um, water can be treated as a private property or not. And the argument which I'm trying to put forward is that because water is an, um, uh, uh, what you call an ecosystem resource, it is a common pool resource, it is a variable resource, it is also very often linked to land and not very often linked to as an independent resource. So water does not share the characteristics of a classical private property. So the implication of that is that the water cannot be treated as a private property. So water essentially has to be treated as a commons. And the instruments which may be effective, which may be uh, useful in terms of private property cannot be, for example, market. Uh, 
cannot be the instrument to allocate or to deal with water and things. So I think this is a very clear understanding which we need to carry forward. And in our fight, uh, fight against privatization or commodification, there's an argument which we should bring forth saying that water essentially doesn't have a characteristic of a private property that way and essentially it has to be treated either to the community and things. Um, so, so because of the peculiar nature of water, both as an ecosystem and commodities, it cannot be treated as a private property. So instruments like classical market mechanisms cannot work efficiently because water lacks the reliability, the ready manipulability, the consistency, and other uh, that the other private property has and things. So this is the mainly my second part argument is that uh, water has certain characteristics, both in terms of biophysical as well as uh, in terms of its common pool nature, which actually sets it apart from other um, uh, resources and strengthens in our argument saying that water essentially has to be treated as a commons and things. The third part, which is the last part, I don't know Arish, how much time will you give me? We are already 3.45. If I take about 10 minutes, that's okay. Or about seven, eight minutes. Yeah, okay, thanks. So this is my last part of the things then that which we come to you know, water governance and see what it is supposed to deliver. Uh, water governance can be seen in different ways, participatory management or community management need not be always equitable and things. So it is also important to unfold, uh, discuss it openly. Uh, what is supposed to this community management is supposed to bring in? What are our desirable goals? Which I call some, what you call or some of us, not only me, there are many others also call it as what is our normative concerns, uh, which uh, drive uh, all these discussions and things. So first I slide, I think uh, I just want to broadly pitch you that uh, there are three broad aspects of water governance. And again, I'm not going to get into the details of water governance because that itself is a very, uh, you know, topic in itself, which we can discuss. So one is that there's an allocative function in terms of water. On what basis, on what norms, water is allocated, people get access to water, how water pricing is done, et cetera, et cetera, is an allocative function, which is done, which is primarily a political or a legislative function. Hmm. So one of the important functions of the governance is that on what basis do you allocate? So if you look at any of the water policy documents or legal other acts and things, there's a clear section which says that on what basis uh, the irrigation water will be given, on what basis the entitlements are decided, who gets access to water, who does not get access to water, et cetera, et cetera, is very clearly let out. And this is more of a political legislative function which is being done and things. The second is are what you call a management function. It is basically, or we can say production related function where the water resource development takes place, whether in the form of watershed development or uh, aquifer uh, uh, recharge programs, large dams, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of water resource development, and how actually the systems are laid out for its distribution uh, and things, and also what we call the operation maintenance of the system. It is basically what you call a management function, which is primarily an executive function. So there's a water resource department which is working, or earlier there's been irrigation department or a water and sanitation or a PWD, whatever type of function that which is primarily an executive function. And third is what I call a regulatory function. Uh, earlier, uh, regulatory functions also were done by both the political legislative or the executive. There was no separate layer which used to be done. But I think it's also a uh, thing which has come after the uh, economic reforms post 90s, where especially first uh, it came in the electricity sector, there was the uh, regular independent regulator uh, who was brought in. And in 2005, six in Maharashtra also, we uh, the government came up with this uh, or the government passed this Act called the Maharashtra Water Resource Regulatory Authority Act, in which there is an independent regulator, supposed to be independent regulator, who can see, okay, this is your agreed upon norms for distribution or allocation of water and type of thing. This is the way the management to be done. So there is a third uh, uh, independent group, which is independent of the legislator and the executive who will oversee all these type of things. There's a lot of experience in Maharashtra about it. There are many states that are trying to copy this today. It's also a policy recommendation in many ways to go for uh, independent regulatory systems and things. Now, if all these things have been done, then probably on what basis are we going to do this? So that is where I feel this whole normative concerns are important. 
Uh, one is what he calls sustainability. Ki the water resource itself, how do you make it sustainable? Here I've given two quotes, one from Gandhi and one from Marx. And in fact, very interesting. I'm not going to read it out and things, uh, but both read quite similar. In fact, this is one of the best definitions I have seen in terms of what is sustainability is and things. Uh, uh, you know, much more than the UN uh, other type of definition and things where say that, uh, you know, we are only trustees, we are not owners, any of this, you know, uh, uh, things. So here in the water sector, we make this distinction between stocks and flow. Flow is what the water available within your annual cycle. Stock is something which is accumulated or stored over, you know, larger, longer times of time. And the implication is that we need to use water within the renewable limits and things. Uh, annual flow should be our main uh, you know, provider of things. If you dig into the stocks, then you are getting into unsustainable use. Of course, this can be further elaborated. There are much more writings available on these things. The second normative concern is basically what I call equity, fairness, and rights. And this is very important uh, when you talk to creating access to water to the uh, marginalized and the deprived sections and things. Because in the water sector, we find two types of inequities. One is what I call historically disadvantaged sections on the basis of class, caste, patriarchy, ethnicity, different forms of minorities, et cetera, et cetera. Because very often access to resources is also in a way decided by where you are located in this historical uh, disadvantages sections and thing. Second is the spatial or locational disadvantages emanating from the biophysical characters. We saw that water actually flows from uh, top to bottom or according to a gradient uh, and things upstream to the downstream. So people who have got land, in the downstream will get benefit out of the whatever the measures you do for water conservation and things. And there are studies to show that the historical disadvantage sections and they map onto the locational or spatial disadvantages. Very often you find the upper part of the watershed, which is much more degraded, where a whole lot of conservation works are taken up is the lands of the Dalis or the you know uh, marginal farmers and things. And the resourceful sections have the land in the uh, 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 where what you call the recharge area in technically. So we all access to water within a particular use, whether it is of productive use like livelihoods or agriculture, etc., or even drinking water, etc. And also we are also talking about delinking water rights and land rights. Today that has been one of the main contention because uh, very often uh, water rights also go according to your land rights. More the land you have, more water you get and things. So it goes against the spirit of equity. There are a lot of social experience around this issue. There are movements uh, which are built around it right from the 80s, which you can find around this. You also talk about fairness in allocation across different uses. And as well, this is a very important issue today when we are going for more and more urbanization and industrialization, more and more water getting reallocated there. I think probably we need to agree upon socially some of the norms for it. Participation in decision making uh, is an important area of things. And also the latent entrant to this discussion is rights of nature or rights of rivers. This only area which is unfolding today. Uh, a lot of people are talking about this. Uh, there are issues with it. There are judicial pronouncements in various countries to uh, declare certain rivers, including the Uttarakhand High Court, which has given a word in India. So this is also coming up an important discussion and things. Uh, participation and democratization. Uh, is an, another uh, normative concern which you have, which we talked about key, the primacy of the local community in decision making should be uh, held. Um, the decision making bodies, how do we represent different uh, mass sections like women, landless, Dalits, uh, etc. How do you create accountability or reverse accountability from the super, uh, the larger structures to the local uh, communities and things? And also, how do we create legally mandated institutional spaces for different stakeholders to come sure, share data, share experience, share knowledge, and also negotiate? And today, this is one of the things which is missing. I mean, this is something which we need to talk about. And also, we need to talk about the democratic institutions. We are not only really talking about democratizing the procedure, process and procedures, but who constitute these institutions? Uh, whether it is the departments, water resource departments, are these basically males, urban, upper caste, upper class to some extent, and also the issue is not only about them. I think it's also the institutions which create knowledge today, the institutions in the CSOs, et cetera, et cetera, who are into implementation of some of these programs also, we need to individually look, saying that who constitute these institutions that how do you democratize and things by bringing in diversity, pluralism, uh, uh, 
uh, more decentral sections into your institutions and things I can this can also change the discourse around water. Also, there is the whole question of issue, efficiency, efficiency, not for the sake of efficiency, we talk about a whole lot of technologies today and things, but the, for me, the important thing is that what happens to the saved water? Does the saved water contribute to more equitable arrangements or creating more access to people who don't have, or does that create more environmental flows, etc., etc., an important issue today it doesn't happen. So the main issue is that how do we bring down the water footprint uh, in the entire thing? So this is the final set. I think one slide I have is there is also certain winds of change which is taking place. One is that there are a whole lot of social experience around which, uh, you know, some of these issues which we talked about, uh, whether it is equitable access, sustainability, and democratic, you know, re uh, restructuring. There are a lot of civil society actions which are taking place uh, across the country. I don't want to name any of that. And also at the government level, you find that, um, you know, from the 12th plan onward, there have been some interesting initiatives. Hmm. I mean, the 12th plan, we also saw the first draft of the water framework, which is a very comprehensive umbrella legislation draft came out where I found that uh, some of the elements of that actually engage with what we discussed today. Or uh, in 2016, there are a very important three reports came out. It's all headed by Mir Shah. I think Mir was also one of the speakers in the series earlier on spirituality, which I found it very interesting uh, and things. So he talked about there's a model bill, uh, draft national water framework bill, which he worked on, they, the committee worked on the Ramaswamy Iyer led committee earlier. And um, then it was relooked by somebody else. Uh, and now there's a third draft, which is available in 2016. There was a um, um, effort to create a, or develop a model groundwater bill which is also very interesting, where groundwater is seen not as a private property or a thing, it's more of a common pool resource and its implications. And third, also an effort to restructure the mainstream water institutions, whether it is Central Water Commission or the Central Groundwater Board into a National Water Commission with the branches in the different river basins and effort to bring in more interdisciplinary uh, type of thing into that. Um, in 2020-21, there was an effort to draft a new national water policy, which also actually engages with most of these elements we discussed have been included uh, in that draft. Uh, though the draft was submitted in 2021, the, the document is not even made into the public. So though we say that there are some interesting ideas and concepts and being discussed at uh, policy levels, we find also roadblocks and uh, uh, things. And so it's not an easy thing. So the, we have been talking about the winds of change for a quite a bit of time. And it's also a very pet expression of Mirsha to talk about winds of change. But we also find that there's an equal resistance. And I think this is the where we need to, the civil society and the academics need to work together to force this discourse and uh, make it a much more of a scientific mass movement. Only then probably what we talked about, we commoning water, otherwise, I'm afraid in the next maybe 10, 15 years, whatever little we talk about the common, uh, common pool resource today, we are having a common water commons, will be completely lost on the onslaught of capitalist uh, development in the country. Um, as I think I'll stop here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I nearly took about 15 minutes. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, this time we will, yeah. Okay, thanks. Th thanks a lot. Thank yeah. you so uh, much, Mr. Uh, Joy. This was an excellent, uh, presentation. I think uh, all our participants also no doubt enjoyed this uh, framing of uh, the issue that you have provided, uh, giving us, uh, first of all, with, with the first part of your lecture where you uh, helped us problematize the, the concept of community and, and to begin to see how uh, the, the, the ground reality requires us to acknowledge the issue of equity especially, and you spoke of the question of caste. And then uh, the, uh, the, the going on to discuss the biophysical and sociocultural uh, setting in which the concept of uh, water is understood as a commons. And why, I think that helped really uh, uh, bring clarity uh, to this discussion. And of course, then the normative concerns, which was the third part, um, I'll go quickly to the questions and comments. Uh, so the first question, it says, it seems easy, I think it should be two, to get communities or groups to show initiative or agency for short-term projects. 
how do they learn to develop sense of initiative and sense of agency over long term for processes that are very complex like managing natural systems uh, i don't know if you want to take a few at together um we can take a few i think probably okay. that's okay yeah the second question is hasn't lpg regime right liberalization uh, globalization yeah. created more egalitarianism in use of water and remove caste system is it this answer to solving social injustice yeah. in other words is in the market addressing that uh, hierarchy issue yeah. the third one is what is the right scale at which to conceptualize water governance is it local community yeah and uh, maybe one more or is yeah, it yeah. uh, no i can just uh, take up this three quickly okay, then okay, uh, sure. yeah yeah anyway thanks for raising very important questions i think yeah that is this is i think this part will be the more interesting part of the uh, session i think where we we'll take it up yeah so the first concern about uh, you know communities more uh, into uh, short term projects and things and how do we create an agency for them the long term process i mean this is a very complex issue i mean i always say that water is a wicked problem and uh, there is no easy solutions uh, today nowadays um, uh, there are people who are saying you no know, there is a silver bullet to solve all the water problems or it can be solved in one year and type of thing which i think they are telling lies i don't think it is it's a very complex issue and it need many levels of iterations and discussions and uh, that type of thing and um, probably you might solve something today it will give to new problems and we need to have constant engagement and only then we can do that i think see probably uh, when we talk about local communities and whether short term long term and thing is also i think we need to internally look at um, uh, how um, you know basically it is the uh, civil society organizers who work directly with the communities mostly and they work on different water projects whether it is watershed development or drinking water sanitation or even restructuring public irrigation through water use associations etc etc and things and i think probably we need to re examine the civil society attitudes to water also because the way when you interface with communities i mean of course the communities have got or different sections within the community also have got their own uh, pressures and other type of there are certain immediate things to be done for example my crop is standing today and there is no rainfall and you need to give some water to a long term perspective of an assured uh, water and things so my thing is that uh, how do we create this uh, you know water literacy which is a long term process i mean understanding this complexity uh, in fact some years back uh, baragan began samiti had set up a resource group in which uh, some of us are part of and we were creating that seeing that beyond literacy how do you create and do resource literacy and things where we take to take you know water and things so unless we also expose people to uh, some of these successful things where people are engaged in a long term have brought in more sustainable management more equitable arrangements and things put new data information experience before people and people also then change their choices to some extent it's a dynamic thing so i think it's a two way process of one uh, working with the communities with a different type of mindset and i suppose the first step is to have a change in the mindset itself and there are no short term solutions to such problems like water and things and uh, it is going to be a tough uh, ask and it's not that the communities are not engaged with today i can take you to some a few at least communities where people have been engaged with this water issue for the last 30 years and whatever the norms they have created in terms of groundwater abstraction what type of crops to be taken they are still standing they are still adhering to it so i think it is also a process where many of us who are involved in the water sector also how do we perceive this issue and thing then engaging with the community that's what i would say probably Uh, anybody else want to add to it you can do it the second really uh, question is that whether lpg regime has opened up to more egalitarianism or whether it addresses the caste system and things uh, whether that can be an answer to social injustice so my broad answer is is no because i think probably because the lpg regime what are the spaces which we had for more direct people's engagement is also getting foreclosed it is true it has created certain participatory mechanisms i'm not saying that it did not now for example uh, uh, many states have passed acts like participatory irrigation management acts i think about 13 14 states where the farmers can form their own water association take over the water management at certain levels and things it has opened up certain 
institutional spaces for discussions and things. But I don't think that uh, it addresses the issue of injustice and caste and things, because we also find that more and more water is getting out of the primary livelihood sectors and things and getting concentrated in different hands and things. So probably overall, I would say that uh, LPG is not. Now, you just take up the whole question of, uh, you know, water pricing to the whole question of getting the, you know, the state responsibility is not there in terms of investments. They say that the entire cost sunk into the water sector, whether it's the capital cost or the operational costs have to come back as water tariff. Now, who's going to bear this blunt? Not the rich, it is the poorer. And there are studies to show that the urban poor pay much more for the amount of water they use than the rich and things. So probably LPG is not be the answer. I'm not denying that there are no learnings from it. We can learn from it, but then probably we need to re-articulate in a different manner from a more of an environmental justice perspective. That's what I would argue. The third is, um, what is the right scale in terms of conceptualized water governance? So there also is a very complex issue. Like I don't have a bullet answer to it, but I'm thinking aloud here. So what I would say is that uh, looking at uh, the way I said, the water is both as a local and a non-local resource. And many of the policy documents have been talking about, you know, basin as a unit of planning and management. That may be too large. You know, you can't even direct democracy or other type of things cannot there. So you need to pitch at a scale where some of these contradictions are visible. At a micro watershed level, there are micro watershed committees, uh, watershed committees which are managing things, but many of these contradictions are not visible. Especially, for example, let's say allocation. Apart from domestic water allocation versus agriculture, which is also an important area. Uh, for example, the growing demand for cities or water reallocation taken from a particular uh, basin or a sub-basin, that does not play out at a micro watershed scale or a village scale. It's much more larger. So some of us have been saying that maybe a sub-basin could be a good unit of you know, more direct uh, democratic participation. And, and some of these contradictions are also played out there. So I would pitch as a simplistic answer at a sub-basin scale, probably we can. And also we're talking about a nested institutional framework. We can build up institutions right from the micro watershed and move upward. All the water policy I've been talking about, uh, you know, river basin organization, but nowhere in the country it has been formed. And even if this whole concept is about like a bureaucratic type of setup where the different concerned secretaries will come together and things. But really, if you have to make it a more democratic platforms, then the stakeholder involvement at different scales are important. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Joy. The next yeah. question is uh, the notion of water flows from upstream to downstream puts the burden on people living in the upstream to conserve water while downstream communities enjoy the water rights. The perspective should change to see the water in the form of a cycle and everyone should be held responsible for its sustainability in the water cycle. The next question is, uh, how can water rights be delinked from land rights when it comes to groundwater? And uh, one more, if, if, if it's okay, what are the institutional spaces for stakeholder participation? What are successful examples? Yeah, I mean, all the three are very important questions. I don't know how detailed I'm going to deal with. And I liked all the three questions. Especially, uh, the first one is about this whole question of downstream, upstream, downstream. Um, um, I think it's also a very clear case of environmental justice because one set of people pay the price for conservation and another set of people get the benefit. Hmm. See, so the whole question of how do you share the environmental goods and bads, for example. And... Uh, only there are a few cases where I've seen where some amount of fairer sharing between upstream and downstream is done through institutional rules and institutions and things. So if you look at even watershed development programs and things, uh, there are very few number of uh, success cases where we can find that where their institutes have been put for, uh, you know, followed, then there is a much fairer uh, uh, success and there have been much fairer distribution. In fact, it's not only in terms of water. Now, what happens is that, uh, in fact, in Maharashtra, there was a classic example of where um, the coal conservation works and plantation activities are taken up in the upper part of the basin, where the Dalits and the landlords take their small ruminants for, let's say, grazing. And it was closed. 
they were excluded because there was a complete ban on greasing. And these people who are the smaller ruminants where you know, there was an awareness program was conducted saying that how some small ruminants like you know, uh, sheep and goats are enemies of eco ecology or ecosystems and trees, and they have been asked to sell off. You know, that is only productive assets or livelihood assets they had. So after a few years, there was a revolt by the people that we don't want your watershed program. So then you can devise certain things. It can be a staggered way of uh, enclosures. You don't ban the entire thing. Or there are examples where they say you can cut and take the grass and feed the animals. Or there are also in one case, which I've seen when I was doing a review of watershed development, they created certain technological options for people in the upstream, storing certain amount of water there itself through farm ponds and other type of things so that they get certain access to water. So I think through a combination of institutions and technology, uh, provided the intervening agency has the mindset of equity between upstream and downstream, probably this can be uh, taken care of to some extent. But it's a very... Uh, yeah, I think. Second is that how can water rights be dealing from land rights when it comes to groundwater? This was a very complex issue. I don't think I'll be the best person to uh, argue this. Uh, there have been some few examples where it has been done. Now, for example, um, in Hivre Bazar, what did they do? Basically, they did for a watershed development. And we should also understand through watershed development, what we're doing is that we are trying to make more water percolate or recharge into groundwater. So you replenish your groundwater. So in a way, you are converting surface water into groundwater. And doing this conversion, as I said earlier, the water also goes through a property regime change. When the water remains as surface water, it's more seen as a community and more as a, let's say, common or common property resource. The moment it is percolated and recharged, appears as groundwater, then it becomes a private property. So one way is that how do you create a balance between the two when you do, between surface water and groundwater, because they are not two resources, it's one resource appearing at two, in two different forms. Second is that you can also craft institutional norms. Now in Hivre Bazar, they said that no bore well will be used for agriculture purposes. It's only a dug well, which put a limit to how much water and how much deeper you can extract in this and makes water a little more egalitarianly available to all the people. And plus, they said no sugar cane on, uh, in this area. So there are people who have been able to take care of that. Uh, so, so there are certain community practices where they have been able to do. There have been examples of other examples of Pani Panjayat and also what we are doing in uh, South Maharashtra today, where there is a per capita water allocation, irrespective of whether it is groundwater or surface water, every person or every family gets so much access to water. And then you have an institution to manage it and things. The third, I think, is that you also need conducive policies. Today, I think one of the major uh, gray area is that most of the policies still treat groundwater as a private property. Except that whatever I told you about the 2016, the model groundwater bill actually talks about groundwater as a common pool resource. Then I think probably you can have a, a different set of uh, measures to bring that in. Uh, the third question is, what are the institutional spaces for stakeholder participation? So I would say that um, at the moment, we really do not have a, a legal man legally mandated institutional spaces. There are no institutions, uh, you know, the decisions of those stakeholders can be binding on the state, unlike in the West. In the West, they have created such institutionalized platforms and things where the stakeholders come together, they do studies with the help of academic institutions, and whatever the stakeholders decide is the final word. Today, we don't have that. And the classic case is what happened in Kaveri family, when the Kaveri conflict was in its site, I think MIT, uh, Madras Institute of Development Studies and a close friend of ours called Professor Janakarajan. They had set up something called a Kaveri family of farmers between Karnataka and uh, Tamil Nadu. And they did come up with a sharing formula. But that did not have a bearing on the working of the tribunal, which is the official instrument to allocate water across states and things. So that's what I'm saying that today we don't have, but there are certain civil society examples where such platform is set up on certain specific issues like water pollution, for example. So industrialists and farmers coming together to monitor and do certain things. So there are some isolated examples of that type, which is there. Otherwise, by and large in India, we don't have a institutional space for different stakeholders to come together to do it today. Yeah. Okay. The next question, uh, the next set of questions, isn't the Jal Shakti mission of the state a success? 
what are your thoughts on it then the next is can the multi scale governance of water succeed without genuine devolution of pris and urban self governments especially around the question of land use planning and the third one if if you will allow one more uh, sir absolutely loved your presentation my question is personal to me as an individual what should a, an urban middle class youth not directly involved in this field of study and practice do in their personal lives regarding the youth issue of water sustainability surely there is more to do than just to be caught to be a conscious user of municipal water supply okay yeah so i think uh, the issue about jal shakti mission i'm not really followed up jal shakti mission because that is uh, apart from bit of an anecdotal information i have or what i have seen in some of the villages we are working and things um See, there's a larger critique about Jal Shakti Mission, which out there saying that um, you know, uh, drinking water is, for example, is a much more of a decentralized way of managing it and things. People have certain type of already existing systems of meeting their rural drinking water, either through wells or other type of decentralized uh, systems. So the Gram Panchayat and people have done. Today, over above that, we are bringing in a new system completely. not even with engaging with this this and try to put saying that har ghar ko ka nal or other type of this so the whole sarcastic comment is that yeah you might get a nal or a tap but the tap may not have water so i think unless we talk about the source sustainability issues onwards and on what basis this is going to be done and things is not going to be there now one simple thing in some of the gram panchayats we are working uh, we have seen that under the jala uh, jala jeevan uh, jala shakti mission uh, thing uh oh sorry this is not jjm i i was a little uh, taken by this so it's not jjm it's a jala shakti mission uh i would say that i have not followed up jala shakti missions work i know there are certain districts they have taken up for uh, intensive involvement and things but i think the results are yet to show because i think this was last 2 3 years uh, certain districts they have problematic uh, districts they have set it up and things but basically the issue is that they are going to make intervention in a sectoral basis like they might make uh, intervention in the agriculture some water conservation etc etc but an integrated approach probably that is in come so i think jal shakti mission back to this one then probably we need to engage with uh, uh, at a basin scale uh, not as a administered unit and other things to manage and see uh, do all that so that i think is very less being done and also if jal shakti mission can take up in a extensive manner what i called water resource literacy as an important area uh, that will be the uh, thing rajesh yeah yes rajesh my friend he so we have been working together for some time so uh, i am absolutely agree with him that uh, this can succeed in terms of self you know governance only without um, genuine devolution of uh, power power in terms of not only political administrative thing but i think even financial thing which is i think probably what, uh, the things which are uh, lacking today unlike kerala for example there is a financial devolution of power which has taken place where there is a commitment by the state that 40% of the plant funds will be uh, spent on the plants which the people themselves either at the ward level or at the gram panchayat level bring up it will be implemented but i don't think that type of a uh, devolution of power financial powers have taken place and he is absolutely right unless this takes place and um, uh, you know more accountability is built up and a from a what i call a bottom up approach either from a ward sabha or a uh, ward sabha in terms of both urban as well as in the larger gram panchayat areas and type of thing this is done it's not done and also connected this whole question of land use planning now land use planning has been earlier but i don't think much of a land use planning takes place now officially other way there used to be district planning and other type of thing today i don't think it takes place so i think the important thing which rajesh which i agree with you is that s yes, if uh, panchayati raj institutions at different scales are to be the main instruments of this change or are to bring in then they have to be both capacitated because that is one important issue because in terms of the capacity is also an issue uh, it should be done there should be more devolution of political as well as um, uh, uh, um, financial powers so one of the small things is that for example if a gram sabha decides 
that no sugarcane will be cultivated in that particular area, is that decision binding? So today probably no. Today in Hivre Bazaar, there is an enlightened serpent who pushes some of these things so people listen. But tomorrow, if he's removed from the scene, we really don't know that these institutional norms will stand. So one of the things we have been also arguing, so that unless Gram Sabhas are politically empowered to take resource regulation decisions, probably this cannot take. So I agree with uh, Rajesh on that. Yes. Um, uh, it's about middle class and, um, you know, at a personal level, one can do. I mean, uh, I, I suppose you can do as a conscious citizen many ways you can intervene in things is not more uh, uh, in many. I mean, one is, of course, you clearly mentioned that, uh, you no, know, how do you go beyond some of the user behaviors? I mean, there are, that's also an important area because behavioral change itself is an important thing, which is as a, both a personal as well as a collective uh, type of dimensions and things. And either as a student or as a young person, we can also intervene in our own context. Maybe the Mohalla we live in, the type of small settlements we live in, uh, can we not uh, collect data there? What's the type of water supply we are getting? What's the type of other, what is the waste? So, so there are maybe if you become conscious about type of thing, maybe right from data to making people aware of that, how we are going to manage water, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can be done even at an individual level and things. And also, there are institutions or organizations you can connect with in the cities. I, I'm sure Delhi, there are many organizations working on water issues, uh, mainstream institute to more civil society and movement groups and things. We are talking about right for water privatization to various other type of aspects and things. So, where you could be able to uh, connect with people, and of course, what you can do individually also to make more people aware of uh, issues is a, a thing which you can do. Yeah. So last three questions, uh, Mr. Joy, sorry for keeping you waiting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What are community-based mechanisms for delinking land rights and linking to livelihood rights? Shortage of water has led to low agricultural productivity and affected food security and pushed rural people to out-migrate to cities. That is from Rabindranath Pati. Then the okay. next question is from uh, Yasin, who says, uh, um, what kind of practical steps, I'm just taking the question, what kind of practical steps can we explore and implement to make accountability of larger structures and agents to the local community a reality. I think he, so he's talking about yeah. the industry, the, and secondly, he asked, what is the role of academic research, technology, innovation, and most importantly, educational endeavors to make such a large scale paradigm shift towards trusteeship and stewardship instead of blind consumption and exploitation? And the last question is from Suhas Kolekar, who says, how do we ensure protection from chemical pollution by industrial effluents in water? I'm, I'm assuming that is his. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is also quite a mouthful, I think, the <laughs> questions, okay. yeah. So the first question, I mean, uh, Rabindranath's question about delinking land right and water right, et cetera, and linking it to livelihood. Uh, we have certain examples today, started within the 80s in the Pani Panjait area of Pune district, where they said that water rights will go with the number of people you have in a family, not the land, how much you have and things. But that was an experiment done in about 30, 40 villages in a particular Tursil and things. It ran for some time after about 15, 20 years, probably it also declined to some extent. Uh, or later then I think there's been also picked up in South Maharashtra where some of us are part of that movement where also efforts being made to restructure irrigation schemes on more equitable lines where we say, okay, okay there's a per capita water location and whether you have land or no land or whether you have uh, larger parcels of land also, you'll get only so much of water and you need to manage your production based on that and things. Now, today, the issue is that um, we don't have a legal mechanisms to do this. None of the water policies or acts or land and things actually this. So what we find is that, um, uh, you know, we can also start with what you call a, with an incremental approach to some extent. Um, saying that there are still spaces within the system which you allow you to go for a little more egalitarian arrangements and things. 
Now, land redistribution was a major program among the left parties once upon a time. All the parties had a land reform program where land to the tiller or land redistribution to be taken place and things. But today, probably, though it's an important question, because there are certain areas where 30, 40% of the people, rural people, don't have access to land. Like in Maharashtra, for example, the Maratwada region is a very classical case of that. So I think this is something, it's a long-term thing which you talk about saying that, uh, you know, how people can be mobilized. I think this can be only through political mobilization. And as a result of that, you can change results, uh, you know, on things. But there are also other spaces today. Uh, in fact, I think Gobal Kadekudi and others have done a little old study in which they have tried to estimate what is the type of land, the extent of land we have in the country, which share a common property characteristics, which is not entirely privately owned. This is large. And even if we make arrangements for that land to be provided to people, not as an individualized you know, individual rights or something, but as collective entities. And probably that itself is a very productive asset, which we have, and it's huge in the country, where uh, depending on the type of land and the type of vegetation they have, they can be also used. And what are the entitlements of water they have, they can use it to make it a very productive system. Second is that since there's a cap on the water entitlement, because in that you are saying that, okay, only this much water you will get. Now the issue is that key, then probably, even the landlords getting access to water that can be used to bargain, negotiate with the landowners saying that, okay, anyway, you can't cultivate everything in an irrigated manner because you don't have water. I will use my water, you give the land and the landlords can get or the marginal sections can get a better deal in terms of um, uh, uh, produce sharing arrangements and things. So there are different things which are possible within the system which you can explore. And of course, the radical answer is that we need to go for a radical land reform land, both research of land and water together and things. Uh, that is why I think for that we need uh, social movements around it and things. I don't think civil uh, NGOs can do such works and things. The third question uh, and the, uh, related to her question is that this whole academic research and technology innovation. Um, I mean, of course, this is an important area because I think, I, as I said, when I ended saying that academics and activists need to work together to bring these things into both practice and policy uh, type of a thing. And also it needs new knowledge. Nowadays, we're talking about co-production of knowledge, mm. where it's not only an academic end or academic sitting in the academic institution, but they're also aligned with different stakeholders, especially activists, and then how do you produce knowledge in a much more collective and collaborative manner, which is more socially relevant, is an answer to that. Educators, especially at the younger uh, level, see if you can bring in water as an important area of engagement. Even now, for example, high schools, we have a very trained high school science teachers. Can we make our high schools also centers of data collection? How much is the water rainfall we get? I don't think anybody has an idea. How is the water being used today in that village? Is there any ways of making it better, optimize it and things? So none of these things have been taken up. And many places where I go, I ask the students, have you seen a Patwari map, a cadastral map? which is a very important instrument today, but none of them have. They haven't seen a map of the US or the somewhere else, but their own village map, they're not seen. So I think as teachers also, we need to pick up these issues right at the earlier age of uh, children, make them available, make them interested in some of these issues. I think that's what educators uh, can do and contribute to this larger concept of uh, water resource literacy and things. Suhasta's question is about industrial pollution. I'm sure she has the answer. She said, like an activist like me. I don't know whether she wants to come in and tell something. Uh, I mean, this is, a, I mean, there are certain short term means as well as a long term uh, thing. One is that short term is that there are certain existing laws and regulations thing which is not even adhered to. We have pollu state pollution control boards. They don't do their work. Hmm. It's a more of a pollution promotion boards than a control bo uh, type of thing because they, we know how it is done. Uh, in fact, I think friends in Karnataka, I think Sharad and people have done a study about that, saying that even there's a conflict of interest who constitute these pollution control boards, the directors. They're also industry owners very often. So there's a conflict of interest right from there. So I think issues of that type to adhering to some of the laws which we already have, even that is not being done. There is no proper monitoring of the, uh, you know, thing. And there are also studies saying that how the industries cheat also because they don't release the water when people see. A thing. So in the middle of the night, probably they release all the effluents and things. So there are things 
and some of the places they have been also watchdog committees of citizens. Um, uh, in the Tungabhadra, there was a huge uh, pollution case against uh, the uh, polyfibers factory, which is a Birla factory, massive uh, movement. So then the court had to this one, then the court appointed a citizens committee, which has been working as a watchdog. So that is also there. And of course, the long term is that whether whatever industries we should have, we the need or this type of industrialization, because industrialization seems to only route where they want to go for this uh, GDP and other type of things. So probably questioning that also. I think there be multiple levels we need to work uh, so as on that. Yeah. That. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Joy. I won't take more of more of your time. It's no. it's it's well half an hour beyond our uh, our uh, scheduled time. I'd like to thank you for your very generous uh, offering of time and and the guidance really for uh, our participants. And I'm sure all of us will be have have leave this. Uh, discussion much more enriched with, of course, with many questions also. And, yeah. and many new pathways have been opened up in our thinking for further exploration and initiative. Um, so um, friends, the, the recording of this lecture will be available on our uh, YouTube channel and it will be shared with all the participants. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are people who ask for it. So if you share it, then we'll also circulate yeah. to people. Yeah. yeah. Certainly, certainly. Yeah. Thank you again okay. to, uh, to Mr. Joy yeah. for this excellent uh, uh, introduction to this very complex area. And to all our participants for staying engaged and asking such thought provoking questions. I think we tired Mr. Joy by the end. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it was a very, very fruitful uh, 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 lecture. And we hope to look forward to seeing you all uh, for our next lecture. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. And everybody. Yeah. Bye.